Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. Well, I'm excited to begin to continue a little bit with what Pastor Mauricio was sharing on uh, Sunday when he was talking about possessing your promised land. Uh, I love the subject, and, uh, you know, I believe that the way that you possess your promised land is incremental. I believe that there are things that you're believing for, and you have to observe certain things from the word in order to get to that next level. Uh, I don't think the promised land is a one, one-time thing. I, I believe it's ever-increasing and always moving upward until, obviously, we go home to be with the Lord. That's the ultimate promised land. But I want to talk to you about some principles about possessing your promised land. Uh, and Pastor Marisa wanted me to talk a little bit about persevering to possess your promised land. Um, sometimes when we hear the word persevere or endure in a biblical context, we're like, ah, I really don't want to persevere. I don't want to endure. I don't want to suffer. I don't want to have any of those elements added to my Christianity. I think most of us feel that way because when we, before we got saved, we were going through all that stuff. And Jesus said, you that are weary, come unto me and I'll give you rest. And it's true. But I think a lot of the strugglings and the sufferings that we do as believers are some of them are unnecessary. Some of them are rites of passage, of course, but many of them are just looking at the, our struggles and the things that we're de- dealing with from an earthly paradigm instead of from a, from a kingdom perspective. And if we can learn and train ourselves to see things the way God sees, we'll be l- less affected by things that uh, we struggle with in life. So let me give you the definition of perseverance. I believe this is just the Webster's definition. It says, a steadfastness in doing something despite difficulty or delay in achieving success. Uh, Difficulty or delay in achieving success. You know, sometimes I think the things that we really have to dig deep for uh, are more meaningful when we finally accomplish them than something that comes easy. Am I the only one that feels that way? You know, uh, I can go to the supermarket and I can buy a zucchini and cut it up and boil it and eat it, and it's good. But it, I don't know if you've ever, like, grown vegetables or a zucchini before, and you're out there every day running pests off of it and fertilizing it and watering it and being out in the heat and cultivating and weeding and going through all the process that it takes to get a flipping zucchini, <laughs> Right? That when it's finally ready to harvest, you take it in and you eat it like caviar. You know, I mean, it's just like, oh, mm -hmm." and I'm not even a big fan of zucchini. But if you grow one, it's like, oh, oh, it's so good. Uh, A friend of mine just grew peaches successfully. It was so difficult to grow peaches in our neighborhood because of all the squirrels that she literally had to cage it in. It looked like a peach tree in the zoo. (laughs) And uh, finally, it came harvest time. And she gave us some, some peaches, and we ran home. I mean, we just like, oh, you know, because I, I was part of the cultivating process, and, and uh, it just tasted amazing. So I think that we will appreciate our promised land more if it doesn't come to us easy, right? And plus, we're learning great things along the way, on the journey. So perseverance, and this is my definition, is, is just being determined. It's a determination But my personal determination comes from revelation. If you don't have a connection with the word, with God, or, you know, dialogue with God in prayer, or you get downloads from heaven that that are inspired by God, the word inspiration means God breathed. You know, if God says, Tim, I want to be a blessing to you, (laughs) right? I mean, it's going to hit me with a prophetic force. It's going to affect my spirit. It's going to change my frequency. It's going to cause me to truly believe that God wants to be a blessing to me because he's he's God breathed his very word. Uh, We call it rhema. 
And, and when that hits your spirit, it gives you an elasticity and an endurance to face adversity because you heard from God. And when you hear from God, big problems don't see that big anymore in the light of what God said. One word from God can change your whole life. And I realize that there are times when God doesn't speak as much as you would like him to speak in difficult times. But there's times when he's just training you to trust. Uh, he, you know, a lot of times you just, I just go back. Everything that God speaks to me, I journal. Every revelation, every idea, every little jot, and every tittle. Because years ago, I got a prophecy in Israel. And the prophecy said, write down everything to be used in God's timing. So I write down everything. So I don't tell you. I get a thought. You know, we'll be on the road, scribble it. And it ends up in my journal. And sometimes you think, you'll hear a whisper and you say, what's that God? But you write it down. And then you go to a meeting. And somebody says, God told me to tell you that. And they're speaking. It's the same word. Right? And you start to get excited because it's like, well. And, and you're beginning to learn, I hear from God. Right? And the more you get that experience of that training of recognizing that was the voice of God. That wasn't my imagination. Uh, the more tuned in you get to it. And then... You can have a life coach, the Holy Spirit, helping you move forward to your destiny, to persevere when persevering is necessary, or to sidestep things that are coming your way that you would call uh, or that, you, that would demand perseverance when really you did, just needed to get out of the way. It's called the law of recognition, right? Just being able to discern what moves you should be making. You know, I have a, a book, and in this book... I have prophecies and promises and everything. And I have a picture. And in the picture, it's, it's from an old children's book or something. It's a picture of uh, a guy sitting down playing chess. And on the other side, there's the devil playing chess with him. And if you saw this picture, you, you looked at the devil. It's Lee Van Cleef, right? It looks just like him, right? And I thought, well, the artist must have just like used to watch westerns or something. So... He's, he's like playing chess with the devil. But then in the spirit, you see Jesus leaning over the back of the guy, the human being that's playing chess with the devil, and he's whispering in his ear. Well, what a fixed game, right? Well, we have that privilege to be able to be one step or ten steps ahead of the enemy if we can tune in to the counsel of God. So perseverance is determination. Determination comes personal revelation. Revelation brings inspiration. And inspiration unlocks. And I learned this. I'm going to tell you a story. Inspiration will unlock reserves of strength and ability to achieve. Do you know that everything you already need is inside of you? Even when you're exhausted, when you're tired and discouraged, Everything you need is right in there. The kingdom of heaven is within you. So I'll tell you a quick story. I woke up one day, and it was my day off from work. I was completely exhausted. You ever wake up in the morning, felt like you never went to sleep at all? Okay. So I wake up, and I thought, what am I going to do with my day? And I was single at the time, and so a lot of times I would just pursue my hobbies or something. And I had a friend that lived in the desert, and he had an old junk antique shop slash antique shop. And uh, there was a bunch of old chairs, you know, in a big circle around an old wood-burning stove. And they all wore overalls and looked like a bunch of hillbillies and stuff. And I, I felt like I was going back in time when I would go out there. And so I would go out there, and I would just sit in the chair, and we'd talk about fishing, and we'd talk about metal detecting and all kinds of stuff and put another log on the fire, you know, this, that, and the other. And it was the way I totally disconnected from reality, and it was rejuvenating. But if I, was, if I wasn't exhausted, I'd be out doing something. But when you're tired, that's a good thing to do. So what would happen is all these boys would come in from the desert, and a lot of them would be out treasure hunting and stuff like that, and they all would come in. And this was a central location where people would trade stories. And I was always interested in those stories. And this one guy came in, oh, yeah, hey, Danny, how you doing, buddy? Hey, man, check this out. And he opens up a box. He starts pulling out all these relics and everything that are over 100 years old from this site. 
not too far from the store and this, that, and the other, and starts handing them around and everything. No one will look at that. Are you kidding? You find, where, where? You know, and we're going around and around and around. And then all of a sudden, everybody is, can't sit still now. They're all, they're all pumped up because of the things that they were seeing, the things that they were handling, and the stories that they were hearing. And, they, and Danny said, well, I'm going to close the store early, man. And we're just going. We're going out there right now. And we're just going to metal tech till the sun goes down and maybe a little bit after the sun goes down because I just saw this and that and the other. And we just, we were pumped. We jumped in the car. We took them out in the middle of the desert. We got shovels. We jumped out. I dug a hole that was like five feet deep. And I'm in this hole. And the Lord speaks to me and said, I thought you were tired. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, yeah, huh. And then all of a sudden, it was like a download of revelation that when you're inspired by a passion, it pulls energy from you you didn't know you had. Because I was tired. I was really exhausted. But you can be emotionally exhausted, but still have all of the reserves of heaven that can be tapped by passion within you. And the reason I'm telling you this is that you have to build a picture of your promised land inside you that, un that unlocks passion, and passion will birth supernatural divine abilities, you know, like power to get wealth or, or whatever it is that you need for the moment because I was dog tired in the morning and digging holes at night, and it did not make sense in the natural because I did not take a nap, Right? And so I realized that if you're inspired by something, you're energized by it. You can tap into a, a strength to pursue. If you're not energized by what you're doing, if you're not passionate about what you're doing, it takes more perseverance, right? So what would be the key? Dig deeper, persevere? No, get inspired. Find out what you love to do. Find out what's awesome about God. Find out what Jesus has called you to do spe specifically because if it's your calling, it will be your passion. And your passion will unlock power. Everyone should have a personal vision. Now, I, hear me. I'm not telling everybody to run off and pursue their passion. Be everyone should have a personal vision that fits into the overall church vision. You know, Pastor Mauricio has a vision, and it's, and it's broad. But then he has other people that are involved that are connecting with his vision, and his vision gives your vision opportunity. You understand? And so as you help another man fulfill his vision, it's unlocking your potential for your vision in the house. And you may come to a point where you're, you're launched full time for that vision. Or you just may be an appendage of a bigger vision and you just run. You know, somebody asked a question once and they said, you know, well, you're a pastor. Or are you a number one guy or are you a number two guy? And I thought to myself for a minute and I said, I'm a number two guy. And he's like, oh, you know, like number one is better. Okay. Do you know why I'm a number two guy? Because a number one guy has to do everything. I have more time to pursue my passion. Do you know Pastor Mauricio has to settle disputes and arguments and create usher curriculums and pick out carpet samples and figure out what the video is going to be like? And I mean, there's so many things for a number one guy to to think about and do. Of course, he tries to raise up people and delegate, but as Preston Maurice said recently, at the end of the day, he's responsible for the church. That's a lot of pressure. That's a lot of weight. Number two, guys, is I'll help you with what I can do, and I can do this, and this is my gifting, and let me study in that area, and I'll just be over here and this, that, and the other, and I can just soak in everything that I'm called to do because I'm passionate about it. I love that. Now, I'm not saying that Pastor Maurice is not passionate about what he does. He, he totally is. But I, I, there's nothing wrong with not having, you know, launching and having your own ministry. You know, sometimes number two guys uh, have space to go deeper in their, in their area, their specialty or their field 
than somebody whose attention has to be divided more. Does that make sense? Yes. You must stay true to both because you can you you must stay true both to your vision and the church vision because you can't get to where God's taking you by yourself. You need people to help you, right? Imagine if only one Israelite tried to go into the promised land to possess it. Okay. That wouldn't have worked out. No, we need everybody to possess our promised land, right? You know what I, I see in this? Uh, I see kind of the, the Amish. Sandra and I went to go visit my sister in Kansas, and we went into the little Jamestown Amish thing and everybody. And it's like they all came in here, and they all have their own religious ideals and things. But they have this thing like the whole town is going to build your house. And when we're done with your house, um, we'll have dinner. And then you'll come help the whole town build my house. It's a heck of a lot easier to have a house that way when everybody's working together, right? Uh, but corruption and, you know, jealousy and all kinds of things get involved in that to make that not work sometimes. And so you have to just embrace that. The, the early church embraced that. Everybody has the same purse. Everybody's in this thing together. Your passion for your personal dream is your driving force because it's tied to your relationship with the Lord and your identity in Christ. If what you're called to do is based on what somebody else thinks you're called to do, you're going to need perseverance. You won't have passion. But if your relationship with God positions you for a download from heaven and God says, this is what I've called you to do, oh, look out, right? All you think about, you'll be thinking about it when you go to bed. You'll be thinking about it when you wake up. You'll be passionate about it. The only thing you need to worry about after that is how you deal with frustrated purpose. Because when you're passionate and you feel roadblocked, then you get a little antsy. But guess what? Patience is a fruit of the Spirit. So you just stay close to Jesus. Knowing who you are will lay the foundation for what you're called to do. And understand this, because everybody's looking at what other people are doing and saying, well, if I had that opportunity, if I was that person, or if I had this or that and the other, you are the way you are for a reason. God created you exactly the way you are, and he didn't make a mistake. Yes, you have made some mistakes, and he needs to redeem you from those mistakes, but it doesn't change what he created you to be, and he can redeem time. He can redeem finances. He can restore everything that the canker worm and the locust ate from your dream and puts you back on course. The fruit of your dream is your inheritance. You know, we keep talking about the inheritance of God and the children of God. Well, if God gives you a dream and you run with that dream, the finish line is your inheritance. And the finish line isn't dying and going to heaven and entering into that here. The finish line is basically when you begin to bear fruit in the things that God has called you to do, your reward is in it. Right? <coughs> if we focus on that, that, that will pull us forward. I think we need more than the promise of hearing well done, good and faithful servant to pull us through a difficult life. Forgive me, I want to hear that very, very badly from the Lord, of course. But if you have a relationship with God, wouldn't you like to go home at night and hear the Lord say, well done today? Good job today? We can have that. Why are we wait until the end of our life to hear well done? And there'll be days when God said, you didn't have a very good day today, did you, Tim? No, sir. <laughs> would you like to have a better day tomorrow? I really would. Would you like to hear some of my ideas? I really would, right? Yeah, that feels just as good as hearing well done. You know, saying you didn't do as good as I would like today, but don't worry, tomorrow's going to be better. You and I are going to work this out. That's awesome, right? That's a loving father helping his son grow. 
The fruit of your dream is your inheritance, and we need more than the promise of hearing well done at the end of the race to pull us forward. We should be talking with our dream coach, the Holy Spirit, every day. All right? God gave us the dream, and he gave us the Holy Spirit to help us achieve it. He's the helper, right? This actually happened. Um, I'm developing a little bit in my ability to hear from God. And Sandra and I are really pressing in a good way into a sensitivity. And, you know, you can say, you know, I'm just so hungry for God. And you're reading more. You're praying more. Um, maybe you go to other meetings and the various things that you're doing because you're just hungry. You want to press in. And everybody's saying, you know, well, you know, if you want to enter into the glory realm, you got to pay the price. What price? Right? I'll pay it. Just tell me what it is, you know. <clears throat> Didn't Jesus pay the price, you know? But then I realized that, no, there is a decision that you have to make to confront distractions and move them aside and say, I just want God, right? It's all I want right now. And so Sandra and I are kind of in that place. And uh, we've got challenges because as soon as you make a quality decision that I just want God, oh, my God, distractions escalate, right? Um, I'll tell you the sweetest little distraction in the world is my, is my little girl. But we have noticed that if Sandra and I are just talking about natural things, she's off playing with spirit horse or something, right? But if we... If we start saying, I believe I heard something from the Lord, and we start talking, she'll come running over and jump up on her lap and interrupt us. And we've tested it. It's like, oh, my God, this is a conspiracy <laughs> to keep us from going deep with God. It's really supernatural. So I hear, I, you know, I go to bed sometimes. Sandra's the dreamer. I have dreams sometimes. We always get up, write everything down because we never know what they might mean and we might get an interpretation later. But I'll wake up, and, you know, when you first wake up, you're kind of in a half sleep. And, man, you better should, you need to keep a journal and a, and a pencil by your bed because God will speak. And I, and I promise you, because you're, you're vibrating at a different frequency right then, you're going to say, oh, okay, I'm going to remember that in 10 minutes when I get up. I'm going to write it down. And it's gone. It's gone, right? So Sandra gets up sometimes earlier than when she's out studying the Word, and I come running out. In a stupor, you know, and I'm looking for my journal like that. She goes, you, you got something. And I said, how'd you know, right? So I sit down, and this is what I heard. I heard, and this was kind of weird, but it was so weird cool. I woke up, and I heard, the Holy Spirit wants to share some ideas with you. I'm like, okay. You know, I just thought it was the coolest thing. I mean, I couldn't have made that up. That would not have come out of my imagination. That was the voice of the Lord. I want you to understand that when I heard that, all of the weariness of our pursuit washed away. All of a sudden, I had a flood of energy and anticipation. And, I, well, man, we went into the word. We went in prayer. We did all of this stuff because I had a word from the Lord saying that the Holy Spirit was as excited about getting ideas to me as I was to find them. Now, if you're moving towards your promised land and you're getting weary, all it takes is one of those little moments, and you're burning again. You're just like, man, let me loose, right? So perseverance is important because there will be times when God will test with time how much you believe he's real. But more often to not, than not, most of the per perseverance that we need to do is a result of us not pressing in to hear those encouraging voices, Right? I'm preaching myself here. Um, this thing propelled me forward. Ay, ay, ay. This thing propelled me. <laughs> this thing propelled me forward with a renewed passion to study and pray into what those ideas might be. Intimacy will always unlock passion, and passion is a strength. God planted a dream seed in your heart that no one else can replace. 
Sometimes we have a void in our heart and we think we can fill it with relationships. Forget about it. There's a dream seed in there that has to come forth and bear fruit. You need to have a Caleb spirit. Your convictions must be stronger than any man's opinion. The Caleb's of today are strong because they have a devotional life. They know what God says. Caleb and Joshua against 10 other people that said something to the contrary, but they knew what they heard. They knew what they knew. These giants are bred for us, man. They weren't swayed by 10 opinions. You need to get such a conviction inside about what God's called you to do that you're not swayed by 10 opinions, right? But you have to walk in love. In other words, you don't get confrontational with people that are trying to give you counsel. You just say, thank you very much. I'll pray about that, right? But then you stick with your convictions. You must define your dream. You must articulate your dream. Habakkuk 2.2 is on the screen. Read an example. Oh, that's my note to myself. Read an example from my book. I'm not going to have time to read the example, but I will tell you this. Don't laugh. I have my own book. It's my own prophecy book. It's called Word Guided Imagery. And with every word from heaven or a prophetic word that I've ever gotten, I record it, type it out very nicely. I put imagery next to it because imagery affects your heart. Abraham had a dream, but he said, how shall I know? God said, look at the stars. God told Abraham, I want you to walk through your promised land. I want you to feel it between your toes. I want you to smell it. I don't want you to just look at the grapes. I want you to try one. I want you to eat, sleep, drink, touch, roll around in the grass of your promised land. Because when it affects all of your circuitry, when it bombards all of your sentence, sentences, it becomes more real than your opposition. So I actually didn't make this for the message. I actually made golden grapes for myself and put it over there. And you could put it next to your stack of bills. And you have to decide, am I going to look at the giants or am I going to look at the grapes? Because whatever you continually behold, you become. And so I decided, no, I'm going to be looking at grapes. I'm going to be looking at symbols of the promise of God. Now, I got a prophetic word, and that prophetic word said God's going to show you where the gold is and how to get it out. You're going to be one of the biggest givers in the body of Christ. Can I tell you when the natural dad does? No, it makes sense right now. Right? Seriously. But what did I do? I need to see that. I need to touch it, right? So I made facsimile gold nuggets, Right? This is a chunk of concrete sprayed gold, right? But I know what nuggets look like, and this looks like a nugget, right? And so when I get up and I read my Bible, and I'm sitting where I sit, my little secret place, I've got physical testimony of prophetic promise that's by me that I could look at and go, that's right, that's right, that's right. Touch it, smell it, now take it. <laughs> so I get a prophecy about authority. And uh, anyway, it says that I'm going to be moving in realms of authority and that they see me like a judge. And I'll be decreeing things like a judge when he hits the gavel, right? So that, it says the devil's deceived you. You have more authority than you think, right? So I realized that I was duped into thinking that I had less authority than I did. And after I saw that, I thought, oh. I guess I better start decreeing, you know, and this, that, and the other. And I kind of rose up inside. It was a very, very powerful prophetic word. You need a partner that's in agreement with your dream, right? So for my birthday, my wife gets me a gift. And in the gift, she had typed out like a little scroll of my prophecy. And we put it in this little scroll holder right here. And she got me a gavel for my birthday. Because she understands how I believe about how these kinds of things that you connect with physically unlock prophetic force. That lady made me bang my hand on, on, on the table and decree things. And she says, you have authority to decree those things. So I went and I got the implements of my declarations. So now when I pray, it's done. I'm healed in Jesus' name. Yeah. Right? I 
got other cool stuff, but man, I'm out of time. Um, listen, God has a dream for you. If you don't know what your dream is, pray and ask God and say, Lord, what is the survey of my inheritance? He told Abraham what the survey of his inheritance was and then said, go walk through it. Breathe it in. I, I want it to become a part of you. I want it to be so profoundly overbearing that every opposition looks ridiculous next to it. But I recognize that not, of us, not all of us maybe yet exactly know what God it is God's calling us to do. But that's okay. We, we have to start somewhere. Somebody once told me, if you don't know what your vision is, get alongside another man's vision and help him. And in that, God will reveal to you what your calling is. Right? And we're all called to something. I'm not talking about five-fold ministry. I'm just talking about you were born for influence and significance in the planet. It could be in the marketplace. Right? The point being, being is that when God begins to reveal things to you, there's an excitement and a passion that will rise up in you. And you'll need to, you, you'll endure things a lot less with passion. Yes, Jesus endured things. He endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. But look, he didn't look at the cross. He looked at the joy. He looked at his bride, right? We all have challenges in our life. Dreams will help diminish your existing pains. They give you hope. They'll lengthen your life. You'll refuse to live the, leave the planet until you fulfill what you know God's called you to do. If you don't know what God's called you to do, the devil will say, well, you, 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 know, you did a pretty good life. You're 60 now. Go home. It's like, no, I'm not even half done, right? Dream, your dream, your God dream will hold you to the planet, right? And if, I'm telling you if, you, if if you're 100 years old and you're not finished, tell God, I'm not done. I want to finish everything you called me to do, and then I'm, I'm out of here. Like Mauricio said, mamba out, <laughs> right? But, man, not, we're not going to do that until we're done. So every believer in here, God is working to reveal to you what your calling is. But maybe there's someone here that they've never made a decision for Jesus. That's always possible. Uh, but if you're here, it's probably the beginning of your dream. If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below. And we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.